journey on Skolivar, Dutch barge yacht, started on the River Suck in Bordnamona country, then up the Shannon and into Loch Ree, with island landfalls and exploration of the hinterland. We digressed into forgotten backwaters and lost harbors slumbering through history. And the twisting channel of the Camlin River bringing us back to Mother Shannon. We are pressing on up the spinal river of Ireland, making the archetypal water journey which all the invaders made. My head is full of matters maritime, and thoughts of ancestors. We head across Loch Bofin in grey weather, making for the narrows at Derry Khan that separated from its sister lake, Bodurg. Then our course is west of north, and we start searching the reed beds for channel markers that will lead us into a labyrinth of backwater. When we do find our channel, it takes us first into a landscape without people, a place of contemplation. Some writer once used a beautiful phrase to describe the strange release of fancy you can achieve in territory like this. There are curlews of the imagination that suddenly go crying through the waste spaces in the mind. It can be a solitary vice messing about in boats, particularly if you have a fondness for backwaters and little rivers where the hire cruisers seldom go. There's a history to hire cruising on the Shannon, quite a recent history. We were out in India and my husband's mother sent us a book called Green and Silver, which is of a cruise up the canals and on the Shannon. And it sounded so attractive that my husband got the idea of starting up our cruises, because uh, we wanted to get away from India anyway. And we came back in, I suppose, 1957 and did a car tour of the river and picked where we thought we would like to start a business. We experimented with what people liked, what people wanted, and gradually got ourselves established. But we did build our own boats. At that time, we couldn't find any glass fiber boats that we felt were suitable for the river. We had, incidentally, four sailing boats as well as some motor cruisers. And our customers were almost entirely English. And then when the troubles in the north started up, they stopped coming. And uh, the other companies then began to go for the German market. Getting away from it all is the cliché, but that's rather negative. I think the Germans in the hire cruisers and the Irish in their own boats are not just escaping lives of quiet desperation. They're also discovering positive things about themselves and their relationship with this environment. There's a passage in an old guide to the Shannon which catches the mood. This is a place of quiet contemplation where the wireless should be turned off for its sound seems rude and vulgar in the great solitude that encompasses the traveler on every side. We have left our northerly migration route to travel west on a long digression into County Roscommon. The limestone land is lush and there's little traffic. Our destination is Grange Harbour, waterways port for nearby Strokestown. Even the harbour is a soft green place, a little bit of nature tidied up, but not defeated. But Strokestown is actually some distance from its port, 
which means another form of transport. I was a hippie once, and in 1967, I lived on Hayton Ashbury. It all comes crowding back. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids you killed today? I thought of putting flowers in my hair, but it wasn't practical. Too much wind. Old hippies never die, they just get mortgages. I find I've traveled back much further than 1967. Strokestown is the last um, of the great Roscommon houses, and there were over 20 of them less than 150 years ago. And it's all that remains of that tradition, the ascendancy in this part of the country. And also, at its height here, the estate um, controlled 30,000 acres. Well, all of Packen and Mahan um, was born an only child into the house in the 1890s, and in 1914 married Edward Stafford King Herman from Rockingham and Boyle, and it was really this great sort of point of optimism. The two biggest houses in the county united, and they, you know, between them had about 60,000 acres of land and a big London wedding, and they came back to live at Rockingham because it was the grandeur of the two places. And he went off to fight in the war and was, went missing in action almost immediately. And she had to wait about seven years in Rockingham until he was presumed dead and then moved back here. Well, it's not a ruin because of the intervention of Westford Garage, you know, who bought the house uh, complete with its contents, which included all of the estate papers. And uh, this small Strokestown-based company have um, initiated what is now regarded as the best private restoration project anywhere in Ireland. The house is already financially self-supporting. Um, it obviously doesn't generate the sort of funds necessary to develop the museum or restore the gardens, but um, it's actually running itself at the moment. Not making a huge fortune, I might add, but um, as they say in this part of the country, wiping its face. But it's very important that um, people be made aware of you know, our history because uh, you know, there's no other way of understanding what's going on now without obviously rooting it you know, in sort of traditions that go back several centuries. What we are doing now is leaving the great western diversion of Grange Loch and Carnado and heading back north through the gullet of Bodurg and into Loch Tap. The route then winds up the map with a target of Carrick on Shannon by nightfall. But I'm going to abandon ship and use the little blue angling cot that's been following like a faithful dog all the long miles to here. Dick Carney will take over the tiller and follow the navigation into the Jamestown Cut and through the Albert Lock, while racing round the shallow loop of river that the canal avoids and explore part of the Shannon that's seldom seen. The little boat puts me in a much closer relationship with the water. A shift of balance and the gunnel dips towards the swamping point. A wrist flick of the paddle and I travel several yards. This is essential boating, the maximum of contact and the minimum of technology. Uh, 
I have laid down a challenge, muscle against motor. This journey was getting just a bit too easy. I want to up the ante. It was my idea. I think the others reckon I'm cracking up, getting a bit strange. Anyway, I'll give them a run for their money. With any luck, there'll be a queue for the lock and they'll get held up. Mind you, they're probably glad to be rid of me, looking forward to having the boat to themselves and a leisurely trip along the canal. As I reach the bridge of Drumsna, which marks the limit of navigation for ordinary craft, I become absorbed in what I'm doing and rededicated to the purpose of my journey. This river was the invasion route for the Viking boat people, who were my ancestors and who left such an undervalued legacy for everyone who's Irish. I follow in their wake, trying to understand them better so I can improve my understanding of myself. I don't think the others took my challenge seriously. From the beginning, they've been a bit suspicious of the cot, which always creates problems in locks and when we go astern. And Dick Carney knows this river a lot better than I do. Something I glimpse behind his glasses makes me think he already has an idea who is going to win. The angling cot from the estuary of the Shannon is a pure Viking design, still in use after over a thousand years. And this landscape is very like what those Norse explorers must have seen. Scolivar has diesel horsepower on her side, and there's virtually no current in the canal cut. She has to be the favorite in the race, unless, like Aesop's hare, they get overconfident and stop to take too long a break. When the first Vikings arrived, we had no word for the astonishing new technology of planked boats. So we did the best we could. We adapted the name of our clumsy Irish dugouts and learned to build better craft. pools basking in summer sun must have seemed exotic to the hardy Scandinavians. I feel the ancestral escorts drawing closer. They're looking for company. Now it's they who are a little lonely. The current's strengthening and my arms ache. Now I need help and inspiration to push on past the point at which, under normal circumstances, I'd quit the whole attempt. The Vikings don't give up easily. I'm starting to think that it's not so much a question of whether I'll win the race, but whether I'll finish at all. late and totally exhausted. The race was no contest. I lost. But I still win the prize, the prize of privileged insight into hidden times and places. It's hard to explain to them how great the experience was. 
the strength of the current and the fatigue are easy and obvious. The mysterious sensations trickle through the fingers of vocabulary. Well, this whole operation here commenced by a gentleman called Brian Kennedy, a naval architect by profession, and he approached me three, four years ago to build steel hull cruisers on the Shannon, primarily to sell to the higher boat industry. At this stage, I suppose we made the classic mistake that we did not go to the higher companies first, but rather we presented them with a product. And even at that, we were very disappointed to, at the reaction. We felt that maybe, that first of all, we had a good product, we thought. It was Irish built, providing employment for the region. But the reaction was, was basically, I wouldn't say negative, just no interest. As businessmen, we realized that you have to, you know, change course sometimes. We established a market as higher boat operators in Germany. We had confirmations from the major operators that they would take our boats on hire for the 92 season. We then put together our package and set about producing cruisers. The essential point that did come out from all our research was that the end user, i.e. the visitor to Ireland, he required a quality product, and the Germans in particular have, a, have a, a preference for steel, and the reaction was very, very positive. Age talks to age, generation to generation. The shadowy flock of ancestors that have been following me up the river were coming closer again. Carrick has its ghosts of the past too. Some live in the Costello Memorial Chapel, the second smallest chapel in the world. It may be small, but it was built from the same motives as the Taj Mahal, the love of a man for his wife. Edward Costello's beloved wife died in 1877. In his grief, he built the little chapel over her coffin. Now they both lie here, side by side, beneath plate glass panes in the floor. It's a place that generates a certain respect. Outside in the strong daylight is a modern contrast to the dedication of Edward Costello. There's a great tradition of rowing in the town itself, and this is one of the oldest rowing clubs in the country. We started as a schoolgirls four, and then for job reasons, um, the other girls had to drop out. So I continued and I went single sculling. And um, I raced at different levels here in Ireland and on the continent at international level. Well, I got to one Olympics, the Moscow ones in 1980. Um, I finished seventh. I missed the, the big final by, I think, 1,600 of a second. But that's the way it goes. It's a very skillful sport. You have to be terribly fit. I used to train um, about six hours most days, seven days a week. You need a very good coach. You need good equipment. Um, you'd have to have a lot of time, and you'd need to be dedicated. As we cast off, I feel we're leaving one of the few places in Ireland which takes boating as seriously as I do. 
So many towns along the river seem to ignore its presence, but Carrick really lives for and from the water. Well, for instance, in high season, there are between 800 and 1,000 extra people per week coming on the Shannon, just to Carrick and Shannon. And that represents almost 50% of an increase in the population of the town. So those figures, I think, speak for themselves. Uh, people from mainland Europe especially find the attraction of this area very, very strong. And some of the things that keep coming across are the clean air, the clean water, the quiet. It's a great saving in doctor's bills. The uh, switch off effect of a boating holiday is marvellous. Trying to save money on my medical expenses, I head northwards again, up the narrowing Shannon through some small lakes. A backdrop of rolling green hills and tufts of woodland. Gentle, clean landscape. We come to a confluence and leave the Shannon once again in another piece of diversion. This time, we take the left-hand fork and head into the Boyle River. First stop, Coot Hall. The river is twisty and interesting. The banks have come closer, which gives the impression that we're going faster a fluid speed swaying left and right like a skater over ice. Seen from space, the earth is blue and green. And here too, it's revealed in its true colors. There are a lot of truths in travel. We're in the headwaters, Coot Hall. We still have river to travel, places to explore, and another rendezvous with history. Next tonight, our destination is a Himalayan wild sanctuary, and we're in search of the tiger. <laughs> 